70 miles south of San Diego, California, lies the small mountainous city of Ensenada, Mexico. For many children in this area, poverty and the lack of education are simply a way of life. But within this community, there is another group of children, the deaf. The country of Mexico offers little or no assistance to these children, forcing them to survive in a silent world of abandonment. For the deaf children in Mexico, their poverty is a deep feeling of hopelessness. For to be deaf is to be alone. for its southern hospitality and deep cultural history. This region of the U.S. known as the Bible Belt has the highest concentration of churches in America. Today, there are over 700 churches located within the Fayetteville city limits. That the world himself can be saved. And we need to understand something, that God is serious about salvation. When God sent the Lamb into the world, he said, I'm sinning for mankind. And yet mankind don't want to go God's way. We have to understand something, that the only way we're going to get to heaven, we got to do it God's way. What about you tonight? Would you do it God's way? Would you trust him? And in the spring of 1966, church in North Carolina was a way of life. The Everett's were your average all-American family. Ed Everett ran a successful neon sign company and his wife Margaret took care of their six kids, Luke, Eddie, Michael, Stephen, Eva, and Barbara. She also had a small cosmetics company called Studio Girl. To me, it seemed now that I've been here, it seemed back then what the typical American life should be. You know, we had a nice house on Sterling Street. You know, my dad had a good job. For a living, my dad would make neon signs. Uh, back then, neon was just picking up, and he was really good at it. He had learned it as a trade in trade school in New York, and then he took that trade with him to North Carolina and, and built a successful business. And he invented a star that was called the Strato Star, which was a star which had certain angles on it, and each angle was wrapped in a different color neon. I really liked working with my father when he had the neon sign business in North Carolina. I could fit in between the signs and screw in the housings and little parts that needed to be inside the sign where he couldn't fit. So it was fun and satisfying and I actually got paid for it. Mom and dad um, both came to Christ. It was my mom first. And my mom came to Christ through her sister who attended a Billy Graham crusade. And my mom was very open to it and, and, and very, uh, 
joyfully and graciously received Christ as her savior. My dad was a different story. And, um, and, and eventually one day my dad went on a boating trip where it was a complete tobacco and they almost drowned. And uh, they ended up washed ashore within a few blocks of a gentleman that worked for my father who had always been witnessing to dad. Dad goes up to the house, knocks on the door, and he said, you know, I'm all wet. And the guy said, I've been telling you that for the last two years now. And so, you know, that night, my dad right in that guy's house, um, prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart, and life would completely change for mom and dad after that. They were, they were radicals. Growing up, we were going to the church all the time. Church, church, I could see in mom and dad that church was important, uh, to go every Sunday. I mean, nothing, it seemed like nothing could stop them. Yeah, big, very big, beautiful church, very big, tall pillars, brick building, the little steeple on the top of the church. And as soon as it let out, all the deacons would go out in front and have a butt on the stairs of the church and light up. Being in North Carolina, it was perfectly natural back then. I don't, I don't, that might not work nowadays. Well, it was a tobacco belt. All the tobacco farmers, everybody, tobacco was a big thing in North Carolina. So everybody smoked. I'm surprised they didn't smoke inside the church. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember being strict. But then again, I was an unruly kid. But I remember being strict. And being in the Bible belt also in, in North Carolina. If you, they, if you weren't a Christian, you were the odd man out. Christianity was, is very big, or was very big back then, and church was very important. Everybody goes to church on Sunday. I mean, you, you don't, you have to go to church on Sunday. It's not an option. But dad and mom were like, now, comb your hair, get dressed up, slick that back. I mean, it was Sunday morning with a hassle sometimes getting to church. With six children, shine your shoes. Yeah, six kids, it's, yeah. When I was about five years old, um, I got very sick with a bunch of different illnesses. And it started with chicken pox, scarlet fever, strep throat, and then ended up with rheumatic fever. And then somewhere in there between the fevers and the medicine, uh, I lost about 80% of my hearing. And the uniqueness of it was, it took, it took my parents several months to realize that I had a hearing loss. It, it, and to be truthful, it, it seemed a little more muted. It seemed a little bit quiet. Again, I'm only five years old. Um, but I, 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 I remember mom and dad getting mad at me quite often because I wasn't paying attention, but I couldn't hear them. When, when mom and dad found out I was um, deaf, they, uh, they worried, they struggled with it. So mom learned sign language so that she could talk to me, since, uh, so that she could share the gospel with me and, 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 the, and the Bible stories that we love reading so much. Because, uh, you know, she was worried. She was, uh, I, they would say, you know, if he can't hear, how's he going to learn anything? Let alone, you know, learn about Jesus. Because they would say, we don't know if it's progressive, so if Luke goes completely deaf, let's be ready to, to communicate with him. So mom and dad, you know, both learned sign language, and then that opened the doors to the deaf community to my mom. And she started interpreting in our home church uh, because of that. Uh, and and they, they came, it opened the doors, you know, and they were so grateful that they could go to a church and finally understand. Because again, way back then, sign language, you know, there wasn't interpreters interpreting for the deaf in churches like there is now. And that was just a step in God's plan for a bigger picture that he had for them later on down the line. My uh, father was uh, invited to go on this pastor's conference in Florida. They were in North Carolina, at the church in North Carolina, but the pastor's conference was in Florida. So the pastor, I was invited by my dad and a couple of deacons to go because my dad had this big, pretty Cadillac to go in. So that's, why, that's the reason my dad was at the conference, just because he had a car that would, he was, he was just a driver.
And then without that, that conference, you know, again, that would just sit in there and, and there's people up there preaching and doing what they do. But the thing that changed Dad's life is when a gentleman got up to play a song. And the name of the song was called Jesus Use Me. And the chorus of it went, Jesus use me, please Lord don't refuse me, for surely there's something that I can do. Uh, but the uniqueness of that fact was that the guy playing the organ had no arms from the elbow down and no legs from the knees down and he played it on a very special organ. And it's just amazing how God can take a song and touch somebody's life. And my dad sitting there going, I have everything and I'm not being used of God. Isaiah got a glimpse of the glory of God. He fell on his face before God and said, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'd like you bow your heads. I'm just going to ask if there's anyone here tonight, anyone, that will say to God, yes, I will give my life to the Lord in service. Will you give your life to serve God in his kingdom tonight? and he committed from the heart. You know, God, I know you have something for me to do out there, and I don't know what it is yet, but I'm gonna start looking now. And a lot of times when you make that commitment, just like my dad did, you don't know where that commitment's gonna lead. The Everett's would search for over 18 months to find their calling. The answer would come in the form of a flood and a desperate phone call from a missionary in Monterrey, Mexico. My, my father heard about a flood that hit the northern part of Mexico. And because he knew a missionary there, uh, he, figured, he figured the right thing it would be to do would be to load up his car, the Cadillac, uh, with a bunch of clothes and maybe some food and drive there and, uh, and help this missionary out. And basically, basically that was all he was doing. And I, I was little, I remember he was going somewhere, I didn't have a clue, it was Mexico, but he was all fired up, he was excited about it. I'm gonna go down there and help this missionary. You know, they, they've been supporting him financially, that they're gonna go down and take some clothes to him. The, the parents of my father took a day off to go in to see the town of Manoe. Uh, where they were in the park of this town, a little boy comes up to my father and he starts pointing and motioning if he wanted to see shine. And uh, my dad realized he was deaf and that's when the missionary said, um, Ed, this little boy is deaf. You know, he makes his living signing shoes because he's been abandoned by his family. And then he said, Ed, these children need someone to tell them about Jesus. That's when God's calling was finally made clear to my dad, when he heard these children need someone to tell them about Jesus. I mean, I, I wish I could have felt what he felt when he realized this is it. By going to Mexico is where he then, then realized, boy, this is what I'm gonna do. This is what the Lord wants us to do. 
Once he realized, once, once my father realized what the Lord wanted him to do, the first thing he did was call my mother. And we were all at home. And my mother was fairly charismatic back then. And she started screaming and hollering and praising the Lord and hallelujah that we knew what the Lord wanted us to do. We we're going to Mexico and everybody's like, where's Mexico? And he said, sell the boom truck, the big old crane truck, which was his pride and joy. Somebody came and bought the boom truck before he even got back from Mexico. And as long as he's buying the boom truck, he bought the business and the house. It was all one, one piece of land, two acre piece of land in North Carolina. So the same guy buys the whole business. So obviously, that was a door that was open. I could see that one very clear. We're on our way now. When we finally decided we were moving to Mexico, we're on our way, we're going now, my father built a bus, a big old, big old school bus. He uh, converted it into a camper, which the idea was we can sneak all these good things into Mexico, like the refrigerators, the stoves, the couches, and beds, and what have you. And we traveled across the country in that with a, I guess he had a Suburban back then, which he towed a U-Haul with, and we carted everything out here. All the things that happened just getting here. The bus broke down somewhere in, in Johnson City, Texas. And we were there for a week at the, living in this church while we fixed the bus. Now, any person in his right mind right then there would have said, I guess we weren't supposed to go to Mexico. I'll start up a new neon sign shop in Johnson City, Texas. But no, we fixed the bus and carried on. Coming through Tijuana, uh, the first time when we saw Cardboard City, which is what they called this neighborhood of, of houses all made out of cardboard, it was, it was a shock. You know, I come from a nice little house where everybody had brick houses and roofs, and I know I'm sitting, I'm seeing this people living in, in buildings made out of cardboard, and they were falling apart. It, it, was, it was pretty, it was a big cultural shock. A lot of people tend to forget that Mexico is a third world country, and maybe it's because they don't go farther enough in, or, or they don't see the areas of Ensenado, Tijuana, uh, where there is extreme poverty, or even a home that these children come from. To be, to be, to be deaf in Mexico is, um, is very difficult. Um, my parents' goal was to teach these kids how to read and write so that they would not have to be beggars in Mexico. That was always their goal, so that they could go out and make a living on their own. In the spring of 1969, almost four years after Ed dedicated his life to full-time service, the Everett's arrived in Ensenada, Mexico, almost 70 miles south of the U.S. border. When we arrived in Mexico, Dad rented a house, and he put a sign in the window saying school for the deaf, and within two weeks, we had 12 deaf children living with us. The original idea was just to be a school, but when we realized, you know, the parents gave not afford to be taking them back and forth, we decided we'd let them live with us. You know, we had these metal bunk beds in the bedroom, and, then, and there was like one bedroom for all the girls and one bedroom for all the boys, and, and I, I had to stay in that bedroom. I didn't have a whole private bedroom. Uh, the important thing of it was that my mom was behind my dad 100%. She had the same heart that my dad had. Mom didn't know that, but she knew high school Spanish from way back then. Um, but she, she put her heart into it, and, and she'd sit down and she taught these kids the basic ABCs, one, two, three, cat, and dog, you know, boy, girl, and, and just proceed to, to give them a language. And then, you know, once these kids get a language, then we can start teaching them how to read and how to write. Our parents just started bringing deaf kids in and dropping them off, and our, our school started growing. You know, word got out in the community that they had this school to, to teach the, uh, the deaf children. Uh, this was amazing, but we need to find a bigger place and find one soon. We were out here in the Guadalupe Valley uh, looking for property, 
And, and the gentleman that worked for us had a flat tire in front of a ranch, and when the people at the ranch found out that we were looking for property, and said, well, there's a lady by the name of Mary that's selling land. So mom and dad went to see Mary, and she brought us out to this beautiful big piece of property, and my dad knew that this is where God wanted him. Yeah. There was absolutely nothing here. A lot of rocks, a lot of brush. And there wasn't a stone or a foundation or anything. It was just barren land. And dad set up this lean-to. There's no walls around us, a dirt floor. He took the bunk beds that were in all the bedrooms there and put them under this lean-to and put a picnic bench over the one side that we ate off of. And that was our first, our personal first Mexican home. Moving from North Carolina to Ensenada wasn't really that bad because we still had a house and a TV channel and a store on the corner. But once we moved out to the ranch, it was 120 degrees and we didn't even have ice cubes or, or iced tea. Being from North Carolina, you need tea, water, and ice cubes. And all we had was the water, which was warm. And we would drink um, this health food thing, honey and vinegar. Honey and vinegar, warm honey and vinegar. Eva and Eddie and even Michael, you know, they, they, you always heard that they hated it. But I, I thought it was great. I remember, I mean, I was always up in these hills. I was catching anything that moved. It was fun. And when you wake up in the morning, and there's this big cow in your face. Now, cows are cute animals, but not when they're right there and you're just waking up, and you're waking up to this. It was, it was an experience. And I remember the dirt. It was, everything was dirty all the time because you didn't have water to wash things with. When we moved out, and he put up the lean-to, my dad, and, and all the beds on it, and we were sleeping outdoors, even that was better than some of the living conditions that some of these kids came from. And so it was almost like, you know, I mean, some of these kids were used to living in something like that. And even the parents were totally accepting of it because the parents could still see the changes that were happening in their kids' lives. These kids were still learning. I remember eating with the kids, uh, it would be loud, you know, because they would be grunting, they would be clanking, uh, and, and, and they would be like eating if it was their last meal because they weren't used to getting so much food. So they're just like scoffing his food down and hitting a fork against the table and making all kinds of noise. One of the first challenges that had to be overcome was lack of water. The ranch had not obtained a permit for a well. Every gallon of water had to be transported over rugged terrain from several miles away. There was no water. We had water in 55-gallon drums. It was brought from two and a half miles away on the back of a carry-all. My oldest brother drove, I guess, to back and forth to get the water, but he didn't have a talent so far as driving vehicles. I don't know how some of us acquired a talent in some day, but he couldn't. He wasn't able to get the barrels of water from there to here without spilling them off the back or into the Suburban. Now, you can put 150 gallons of water into a Suburban, basically fills it up. took another year and a half for the Everett's to build their first home on their property. The vision for the home was extensive and included living areas and a school. Ed's dream was founded on a promise that where God leads, he will provide. Dad had set out to build this huge two-story house that would basically be everything in one building. By the grace of God, this huge two-story house went up. You know, the dormitories were upstairs, the boys' dormitory and the girls' dormitory, and the three bedrooms for my brothers and sisters and I, and big bathroom in the middle for everybody. And downstairs was my parents' bedroom, living room, a dining room that was used as a classroom when the kids weren't eating in the kitchen. Everything in one big building. Um, I know when the, when the family, when we all moved in, a sense of normality was almost starting to settle in now. We finally have a home. You know, I have a room with walls around me. I got a floor, you know, I got a real bed. You know, I don't have cows looking at me in the morning anymore, bats flying through my hair freaking me out. 
And um, I remember a church group came. Church, that's when church groups and short-term missions started coming to our ministry, and they came down and they painted the outside uh, of the minister of our building. And I remember that day we had a, my mom, I remember my mom said, we had a little celebration, you know, the house is finally finished. And, you know, life is, you know, starting to look normal for a you know, little 11-year-old boy. But unfortunately, three weeks after the house was completed, it, it caught on fire, and, and the whole house completely burned down to the ground. And again, we had nothing. The whole place was in ashes. Dad's 42 years old, Daddy isn't supposed to cry. It was just one of the horrible, most horrible days of his life to see all that go up in smoke. When the, when the house is burning down and eventually burnt down, most of the brothers and sisters thought we were going back to America. They said, uh, you know, Dad and Mom are gonna give up. We're gonna go home now. The kids were put in, in orphanages around us of people that we had made acquaintance with. Uh, my father put us, some of the Luke went to stay with people across the valley. Uh, I stayed in a little camper that was right out here next to this building. I don't know, dad and mom, dad and mom struggled with it. You know, they almost felt like God was closing the door on them. You know, mom and dad didn't know what to do. They didn't know you know, where to go. God got my dad's attention through the house burning down um, to show them they had a bigger plan. Dad was thinking too small. Dad's thoughts were limited to a little church and teaching the children when God was saying, no, I have something bigger, I have something better. And to get your attention, this is what I'm gonna have to do. Prior to the house burning down, Dad got all wrapped up in building a church for the hearing people of Guadalupe. And when the house burned down, we eventually had to move in to that building that was gonna be a church. And Dad, Dad said, he, 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 almost if God has said, I sent you to deal with the deaf children of Mexico, stick to the task at hand. My dad was all wrapped up building the church, not realizing that the ministry that we're doing here to these children, is the church. I wanna start it's, it it's not a building, but it's what we are doing. Over the years, churches began helping us rebuild and provide the funding. One without an end. I feel it inside, calling out to me. It's a voice that whispers my name. It's a kiss without Had it not been for uh, countless people through the years, we wouldn't be where we are today. I would say 90% of the building has been done by volunteers, church groups, and uh, private parties, people coming down and volunteering their time and efforts to build the buildings. Uh, and, you know, and it hasn't been easy. You know? You know, through the tears, Dad and Mom saw the need, and they pressed on. You know, they resolved to press on, and little by little, uh, since 1970, when the house burned down, we began rebuilding this amazing ministry, you know. And we've had over 300 kids go to school here.
My mom and dad, they got very, uh, they were very excited about it. Uh, it was, because they, they, they saw these children as, you know, clean slates. You know, whatever we teach them is going to be impressed upon them almost for the rest of their lives. And here we have an opportunity to give a kid a language. The free home and school became known as Rancho Sordomudo, or Ranch for the Deaf. Over the next several years, the ranch experienced tremendous growth. The new buildings allowed the Everett's to offer help to additional children. It was at this point that most of the Everett children chose to pursue other opportunities in the United States and gradually left the ranch behind. Um, it's the fact that we are it's sort of sort of isolated, so there's no, I mean, for a young man, there's no social life. And, you know, we, we sort of growing up like socially stunted. I'm, I'm 19 years old, and I've been here since, you know, I've been you know, nine, and I, there's, you know, I don't have a car, I don't have any money, I don't have any friends. You know, for a while, um, I did it because I felt obligated to do it. You know, it's it because it was expected of me. It wasn't uh, my cup of tea in the beginning. I really wanted nothing to do with it. It wasn't, uh, wasn't my calling at the time. When I went to Bible school for say, the, in the year that I went there, unless I missed this class, there was nothing about digging a well. There was nothing in about how to smuggle stuff, I mean, bring stuff into the country, right? We didn't have that class. Uh, I lasted about a year and I wanted to come back real bad. Dad, uh, dad got ill and mom called and said, you need to come back and help us at the ranch. So it was 1974 when I came back from being in school in the States and it's been here ever since. I, I, I did leave for a little bit, uh, but God brought me back in his unique way. Uh, and I knew uh, that this is what God really wanted me to do. In 1971, Josefina Muñiz arrived at Rancho Sordomudo. She was eight years old. And like Luke Everett, had lost her hearing at the age of five. After graduating high school, Josefina returned to the ranch to teach Bible. Six years later, she and Luke were married. Eddie's passion for cars would soon lead him to romance as well. Well, there was a uh, tremendous flood here back in 1979 and 80, and me being the hot dog that I am, was the only guy in town who had a four-wheel drive truck that had gasoline in it. And around 9 o'clock that night, one of, the, one of my other buddies came up and he said that a little girl had broken her back. But then he brought it to my attention that she had some really good-looking sisters. We drove down there. It took about an hour and a half to get the six miles down there, and they had this kid wrapped up on a little wooden backboard, I guess it would be called. And they stuck her in the back of the Jeep that I had. And we got to the river, and the river is like the Bible song, deep and wide. So me and the guy who came and got me and two other guys carried this 13-year-old across and put her in the ambulance, and on her merry way she went. So that was all that was made of it. And about six years later, I stopped at the grocery store, and there's this really cute chick there. I mean, she is hot. And all of a sudden, it hits me. That's the little sister that we carried across the river six years ago. She's 19 now, and she is hot. got married about six months later. It's, ah, good question. Why do I stay here? I feel the Lord wants me here now, and it's extremely satisfying what time I do get to spend with the children. If you do something for the wrong reasons, you're never happy. And, uh, but finally got in his unique way to say, no, this is what I want you to do. And once I made my decision, okay, I'm gonna stay here and do this, um, I've had a piece about it. 
I haven't been so frustrated anymore. And God has provided uh, uh, in, in, in wonderful ways. Uh, I, have a, I have a beautiful wife, and I have a great family. But along with love, there would also be a series of tragic events that would strike the Everett family. On Christmas Eve, 1976, Stephen, while enlisted with the Marines, was killed in a car accident. When Stephen died, um, it had been the first time this happened to our family. I was probably 20, 21. I couldn't believe it. I mean, there's no way in the world this guy is laying in the casket dead. And uh, I couldn't bring myself to really believe that he actually died. It got to a point where it didn't bother me. I am, um, it does, but you don't show it. Three years later, Barbara, only 17 years old, was diagnosed with leukemia. Her last moments with her family were Christmas Eve, 1979. And, you know, Barbara just loved the Lord, and she loved working with these children here. And she had done more in her young 17 years of life of serving Jesus through her loving the kids here and teaching them than people do in a lifetime sometimes. And two weeks prior to her passing away, she could no longer talk to us because she had tubes down her throat, but we communicated through sign language still. And the night she was dying, um, an amazing thing happened. When my mom was there, and my mom got us all together later, and she said, you're not going to believe what happened. She says, I was standing outside the observation window of ICU, watching the doctors try to keep Barbara alive. And she said, all of a sudden, Barbara opened her eyes like if she woke up, and she saw me standing in the window. And my mom said, and Barbara began signing. And she looked at me, and she, she said, don't worry, Mom. Jesus is coming to take me. It's finished. And Barbara put her hands down and smiled and went to be with Jesus right then and there. Eventually, Michael also returned to help run the ranch. But in 1994, he was taken by pancreatic cancer, the day after Christmas. Nobody expects to lose your brothers and sisters. I mean, if one family loses one kid, that's catastrophic. I, a lot of times, now that I have my own children, how does my parents go on? after they lost three of theirs. I mean, it would devastate me to lose any of mine. And then my parents went on through losing three of theirs. It's been a long journey. And uh, along the way, we've had our share of tough times, such as the house burning down. And so I left Luke and myself. The death of Michael left the day-to-day -day operations of the ranch to the two youngest Everett boys, Luke and Eddie. Working together would prove more difficult than expected. No, Luke and I have not always got along very well. We actually had knockdown, drag out, punch out fights in the dormitories, at gas stations along the side of the highway. To sum it up, in the last 10 years, we went from hating each other, to a degree, to tolerating each other, to really loving each other and really not wanting, I wouldn't want anybody else other than Eddie besides me to run in this ministry, and I'm sure he feels the same about me now. It would take one more tragedy to bring the two brothers together. This time, it would hit Luke closest to home. While Mexican doctors diagnosed her condition as heat exhaustion, within 24 hours, Josefina's condition declined dramatically. Within days, she was brought to the United States and diagnosed with a severe brain hemorrhage. She was given only a 30% chance to live, and if so, only a 10% chance of ever walking. All this time, I keep thinking to myself, she's gonna be fine. I don't know why 
I mean, I was scared. I remember calling up dad and crying on the phone. Josefina's got uh, a brain hemorrhage. And I remember when dad came into the hospital, his eyes were all red and puffy. And mommy says, you know, dad hasn't stopped crying since he heard this was happening. I mean, dad was, you know, because he, more than I, understood the severity of what was going on with Josefina. Uh, during her recovery, uh, she had two, you know, massive hemorrhagic strokes because of the blood that was on her brain. And uh, with every stroke, there was a devastating effect on another part of her body. He, the doctor comes out and he says, we've done all that we can. We were able to stop the bleeding, um, but we, now we just have to wait and see. And that's when Eddie showed up the next day. It, it, it was devastating. It's my brother's wife. I mean, he loves her better than anybody else in the world. And he's outside thinking everything's ginger peachy. And I had to go outside and tell him, Luke, you know, you need to get prepared for this because I, I really don't, you know, I hate to be the smart older brother, but I don't think she's going to make it. No, he said I was standing in the hall, being cool. And people would come up to me later saying how collected I see. But inside, I was, I was so angry. I was screaming, why God is this happening again? I mean, like, I said, <clears throat> like I said, I was able to retain my composure, but inside I was angry. Why is this happening again? But God, God was merciful. <laughs> and I felt so bad for him, what he was going through. I decided to help and do his job for him while he was gone, this six months or eight months or four months, whatever it was, and dedicated myself to do whatever I could to make it easy for him. That, I think that's one of the points where we started coming together as, as, as brothers should have been for the past 38 years. I, you know, I, I, some, I told somebody once, you know, I wish I could say all during Josefina's time that I was reading my Bible and praising God and thanking Jesus, but, but I never was. And it's, it's wonderful that the love of God for us is not based on how much we praise Him, how much we read our Bible. His love for us is unconditional. No matter what we do or where we go, He will always love us. And when they propped her up in the bed and then she just fell over, she couldn't even, you know, sit up. I remember right there praying, God, help me to be able to live with whatever the outcome is going to be of this. Here she, here she only had a 10% chance of ever walking. And the therapist tried and tried everything to get her to walk again. Now my nine-month-old son was 11 months old, and he started to walk. And then Josefina said, when I saw that, she said, he's going to start walking. I'm not going to be able to keep up with him. So it became a race between Josefina and Sammy, who's going to walk first? And I missed it, but out of so, Josefina, out of so courage one day, she just pulled herself out of the wheelchair and stood up and grabbed the wall in our house. And she just started holding on to the wall and then walking. <clears throat> but God did a miracle. And Josephine attributes that to God. It's through God's prayers and God's people that I am here still serving God, still loving God, still loving my wife, um, because he's God. And he can do amazing things in people even when we think we can't do these things or when we think we can't go on.
a lot of a lot of times what people don't understand is, is the deaf are looked down upon in, in Mexico, and and a lot of times that's the misconception that parents down here have is that because they're deaf they can't learn anything either, and so it, it's hard for them down here. So we have had students here from as far away as Honduras to as close as Guadalupe, which is two miles away. I, I know the homes that they have come from. They are reduced to being almost servants within their own family because there is no communication with the other family members. The students come from a whole range of home environments, but most of them come from very poor homes. We had, um, we had one boy here who was not only deaf, but he had Down syndrome for a while. They would go home in the summer, and then he never came back, and he never came back. And then a couple years later, we met um, the aunt of this boy. And we asked, you know, why did Fernando come back? And she said, well, his mother paid somebody to put him on a bus and just, just ship him down to Guadalajara and just leave him in the city down there. It's happened. We've had kids here that the same thing had happened to them, but yet they ended up in this part of Mexico, and then the police would find them abandoned at the police station and bring them here. They don't come from good backgrounds, and a lot of them have not been communicated to properly, most of them, because of the lack of communication and they have never been able to express their emotions in a proper way. So the kids come here and a lot of them have a lot of aggression. The value of the um, language for the kids, I think, is they have a lot of pent up things that they can't express and they don't even, it seems like they don't even know that they could express them in some way. First of all, a lot of the kids haven't had any, show, any love shown to them and they're carrying guilt. So I think it's very important, first of all, to lift that guilt from them. And watch them when they come. They're, they're not happy when they come. Mostly it's very sad what you see. You know, I have one girl who just recently was talking to her mom and she thought her uncle was her dad. It's very exciting to, to, to for them to, I don't know, the light bulb just comes on. Sometimes you teach for three months before they get a concept, certain kids, and then when they get it, it's just like, yes. <laughs> but that light goes on when they realize, oh, everything has a sign, everything has a name. And it's just amazing to watch, the, you know, they're like, well, what is that? You know, oh, that's a car, or what is that? Or oh, that's a light, you know, what is that? I mean, literally all day, they want to know what's going on. And because they're clean slate, they're like sponges, and they're just soaking up all this information. And, and imagine, imagine you're anywhere from the ages of four, 10, 14, You've never had a language. Now all of a sudden you have a language. You can finally convey your, your thoughts, your feelings, your hurt. A sense of being themselves, a sense of being somebody. That's another part of the reason we stay here, that we keep doing it. It's just so satisfying to see their lives changed. When the students come here, they don't even know the, the country they live in in Mexico. They don't know that they live in a town. They don't have any vocabulary for it. So, I like to start with where they are, open up their minds to the, the wonderful world that God has created for them. For instance, for instance, we had two deaf boys brought to our school here. And when the parents left and came back uh, a month or so later, one of the boys immediately grabbed a piece of paper and he wrote down, my name is Edgardo. And the father shared me this later. He said, when I saw my son write that down, he says, I just completely broke down and started crying. He said, because for 10 years, I thought that they were never going to learn anything. They're, they're here, say, two or three months before they know that they're going to be supplied physically. But then when you start touching their, their needs spiritually, that's when their, their face starts lightening up. They, they don't act the same. They don't even look the same. Scripture says he's carried all our guilt and all our shame. And, and, and then they start to understand because I, I say it, I said, you know, the reason you're here, the reason you're deaf is because God brought you here so that you could learn about him. Because if these kids weren't deaf, I mean, they'd be out in the middle of Mexicali or Oaxaca and they never would have learned about Jesus, probably. It's more important for whether they're going to spend eternity than all these things. And when I sit in our dining room and I see these kids smiling and laughing, you know, where would they be? Even if dad gave up when Steve died, or if I chose to give, give up when my wife went through this.
Since 1990, my husband and I have explored the Baja Peninsula in our camper. And while we were camping there, we realized that the Higuera family who lived up on the Mesa had a deaf child. And through the years, we watched Mari Soul growing up, three years old, four years old, five years old. And we would see her several times a year and interact with the family. A pescar, no puede que mi padre era pescador. Yo llegué a los 12 años a pescar aquí también cuando salí de la primaria. Sí, o sea que nosotros, cuando al principio nosotros no, nunca supimos que ella era sorda. O sea, nosotros pasamos porque la llevé a unos estudios a, a Constitución para, para que le diagnosticaran pues, porque no, no podía escuchar como las demás personas. Y entonces el, el doctor sí nos, nos dijo que tenía problemas auditivos. Por ejemplo, otra opción de escuela no hay, aquí en México no se encuentra ninguna escuela. Kirk and I had realized that there was a school for deaf children in the Guadalupe Valley. We had heard about it. We investigated. And we were welcomed by their head and director, Pastor Luke Everett, to come up and pay the school a visit. As soon as you cross the border, I, I equate it to being fired out of a cannon. The, the radios are off, the scenery is beautiful. Uh, it's just almost uncomparable. It's like the Grand Canyon by the sea. The, the Higueras basically really didn't have a reliable car, any sort of reliable transportation to take Marisol on that sort of a trip. It was just totally a matter of expense. The alternative, she could have been brought up there, the kids that can't get home go to Ensenada and spend their summers in an, in an orphanage where no one signs and they're basically relegated to a, a corner by themselves. It just didn't seem right. The second time we picked up Marisol, she got in the airplane, and as the rest of us were putting on our headsets and using hearing, hearing protection uh, just because of the noise of a small twin, she took the time to sit down and write us a note saying, ha ha, I don't need any. <laughs> yeah, of course it was worth it. Marisol's worth every cent of the, the investment and the trips and the fun that we had. That was just, I'd never trade that for anything. She is an amazing young woman, and I would never have thought the transformation could have been possible or as complete as, as it has been if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. O sea, que el que Marisol haya aprendido a leer y escribir nos beneficia a todos porque hoy nos podemos comunicar tanto nosotros como las demás personas.
of order to me when a former deaf student comes back to visit us and he's driving in with his car that he bought because he found a job and it, it's, it's rewarding. I mean, it, and it seems like that's one of the first things they want to do after they get a car is to come here and show it to us and then go out there and with much struggles, but still find a job. And it, it's, a big, it's a big deal for them, you know, to have this job. It's, it's satisfying to see them when they've grown up and they come back driving a Dodge Dart. This child didn't know he had a name. And he comes back 18 years later driving a Dodge Dart with a video camera taking movies of where he went to school. Where would he have been if my dad didn't start this 30 years ago? In 2006, Ed Everett Sr. passed away of lung cancer at the age of 80. His wife Margaret had died two years earlier. They had given over 30 years of their life to serve the deaf children of Mexico. I took a walk down to the river. When he, when he died, I got sad not only because I was missing him, I was going to miss him, but I got sad because of all the people who would never have the opportunity to meet him and talk to my dad and just see his passion and his twinkle in his eyes as he shared how he got here. You know, even in the later on in his life after he'd been through so much, he still wasn't born. He would still love to challenge and encourage you, you know, and, and say, if this is what God wants you to do, do it. I think God can use anybody with a willing heart. He's using a heart, he's using a hearing impaired person here to reach hundreds of deaf children in the world. He used a man with no arms and legs to reach out and touch my father. You know, it's it's all a decision that you make. It's it, it's got to come from you. It's got to come from your heart. created to minister those around us. The church was the welfare office. The church was social security. As Christians, if we could realize the power of God that we have in us, we could go out and change the world. Where would they be if any time anything got hard, we just gave up? You know, but here they are. You know, I would be missing out on the blessing of seeing a little child come to us with no language, you know, and slowly acquire a language and see a whole world of wonderment open up before them and they're finally able to communicate something. You know, I guess say life isn't easy. Giving up isn't a, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's not an option, you know, because God has a plan for you. Life's, life's gonna happen, but you press on. The greatest reward is gonna be one day when, when we're in heaven and I'll be up there with Eddie and my mom and my dad and my brothers and sisters and all those that have made this ministry possible. And we're gonna look out and we're gonna see, we're gonna see thousands of former deaf people and they're all gonna be praising God uh, with their voices and hearing the angels and, and each other singing with their new hearing. You know, all because of one man, my father saying yes to God. You know, and what a day that's gonna be. And I think that is one of all our Years of hard work and sorrow and tears were vanished. And I'm finally
hear your heart break when you reach for me. Your ears they were broken, but can you see? But my hands are on you, every step of the way. I heard your voice sound every time you pray. You whisper, you whisper to me the kind of voice only an angel sings. You whisper. You whisper to me the kind of voice only an angel sings. But I stepped out in faith when you came to me, man, the broken hearted. Set the captives free. I put down my life. I follow you. The desert places, chill, warm faces, nothing I wouldn't do.